Habakkuk 1.12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them from judgment, and I, O mighty God, you have established them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil, and cannot look on iniquity. Wherefore, if you look you upon them who deal treacherously, and hold your tongue when the wicked devours the man who is more righteous than he. And make men as the fishes of the sea, as the griefing things who have no ruler over them. They take up all of them with the angle. They catch them in their net and gather them <coughs> in the bag. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore by sacrifice unto their net and burn incense unto their drag because by their portion is fat, and their meat plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net, and not spare continually to slay the nations? I will stand upon my watch, and set me upon the tower, and I will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Thank you, Deb. How could you? We often wonder, Brad, I have, I know I have, I ask God, how could you do this? How could this be that you want me to do this? This is, this isn't right. In the chapter 1, in the first verse, just to back up a little bit, Habakkuk asked God, just how long do I need to call on you? Just how long are you going to wait to do something about the sin of these people's lives? Society was in a downward spiral. And as I look at this country and the world as a whole, <coughs> I have to wonder, God, how long are you going to let this go on? These people were stealing and violence towards one another, and we, we have that now. When you think about the question of why God, it's a legitimate question. If you don't know something about God, ask Him. If you don't understand it, ask why. How many two and three year olds you know when they start to talk? What is the main phrase? But why? You give them an answer. But why? Give them another answer. But why? I believe that God is just, He is good, He is merciful, graceful, grace, graciousness, and He loves His people. So why? Why do we have to endure all this sin, all this violence and things that are around us? God requires obedience to His will. There will be punishment for disobedience to His will, to His laws, to the Word of God. The things are written in here. We do disobey them. There's a consequence. Disobedience equals sin. Sin requires death. It often talks about eternal death. Do you think that when we, as a sinner, when, he, when a sinner dies, that's it, lights out, nothing else? That's what death is, isn't it? See, one head do this way. A sinner's body dies the same as a Christian body dies. Our bodies will all die. But 
there's something inside us that's going to live forever. It will live for eternity. So when Scripture says eternal death, it's not talking actually about eternal death. You're not going to die. Your soul isn't going to die. What it's really talking about is eternal separation from God. When Jesus returns, those who love Jesus Christ, those that have given their lives to Jesus Christ, they shall rise again. They will rise with a glorified body to be in the presence of God the Father for eternity, forever. As one version of Scripture says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall live for a long, long time. That's not correct. You will have everlasting life. Eternity. It's not just a long, long time. A hundred years is a long, long time. Two thousand years is a long, long time. But eternity goes forever. It don't stop. What happens to the sinner? He doesn't get a new body. Scripture doesn't really tell us what happens when Jesus returns and there's a resurrection. At the end times, when judgment day comes, what happens to the sinner's bodies? Are they resurrected again? Are they met with their souls again? Some of us have so many blasted aches and pains that God can't get around some days. Do you really want to live with that the rest of your life? You're going to. What about, about eternity? Scripture doesn't specify or tell us that a sinner is going to have the same body as he died in. It does tell us that the Christian will have a resurrected body, have a glorified body. You'll have a new body. When Scripture talks about eternal death, for sinners of this world is actually talking about the soul living for eternity in hell and separation from God. So time doesn't stop when the sinner dies. It's an eternal, eternal separation from God the Father. When we look at the book of Job, there's the same problem of just why is it that the wicked sinner prospers and the God-fearing, loving, obeying Christian has got it so nasty? Job was a man of God. But as you read and study Job, he went through living hell. He suffered greatly. His wife even told him, why in the world don't you just die already and get it over with? Won't you curse God? Maybe it'll stop. Job says no. He continued to love his God. But why did he have to suffer so? I could get into a big long sermon about it, but I'm not going to. But I want you to think about it. Does God really reward sinful living? As you read and study the Old Testament, how many of those people that were sinners, terrible people, 
lived a better life, prospered more than God's own people. Does God allow sinners to prosper? This is where we ask why. I can name a few different people that live worse than I do. They're terrible sinners. But when you look at their life, it seems like they are so well blessed. God's reply starts, His first reply starts in verse 5. He says, just watch what I'm going to do. Here's the thing about it there. You're not going to believe it, even when I tell you. But I'm going to use the Babylonians. And of course, then as you read through the Scripture, God goes into details what kind of people, nasty people they are. That ruthless and greedy nation, they sweep across the surface of the earth, seizing dwelling places that do not belong to them. They are frightening and terrifying. They decide for themselves what is right, leaning on their own understanding. We are specifically told, do not lean on our own understanding. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind, and they gather captives like sand. They just didn't go in and gather up the people and take them as captives. Take them hostage. Do you think the Babylonians had it in their own mind to go conquering the world? See what they do now. <laughs> Verse 6, God says, I am rising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. It's not that these nasty people thought of going on their own to capture Judah. Judea. But God put an end to them to go and conquer and take these people into captivity. This is God's plan of punishment for not or for disobeying His word. Disobeying His law. And this is what Habakkuk was complaining about. How can you take these people that this to punish us. They're worse than we are. <laughs> but as you go looking at the things the people of Judea were doing, it can be understood why it is that God used such a mean and nasty people to punish them. Because what were they doing? What kind of worship were they doing? I'll see you frown. You don't find it in this scripture. You have to go looking at the other books of the Old Bible, of the Old Testament, to find it. Jeremiah 32 talks about it. They built places of worship for the god Baal in the valley of Ben Hinnom so that they could sacrifice their sons and daughters to the god Moloch. God's people were doing this. God's people were sacrificing their own children. Such a disgusting practice was not something I commanded them to do, is what God says. It never even entered my mind to command such a thing. So he says, so Judea is certainly liable for punishment. Stop and think about what the United States of America is doing. Think about it. 
Who's going to come punish us? The question still remained. Why God? How could you? Are you not from everlasting? Oh Lord, my God, my Holy One. Sure, you've marked them for punishment. But how could you? <coughs> you are a God of goodness and love. <coughs> you can't stand to be around evilness and sin. You don't like the sight of sin. Of the things of the devil. And now look at you. Look at all those awful people. And you're going to use them to punish us. Have you considered the question I asked you yet last week? About if a non-Christian, you know he's a nasty sinner, comes to you and says, as a Christian, you shouldn't be living that way. You shouldn't have done that. Have you thought about how that would make you feel? When you think you're living a pretty good life, according to God's word, and have a non-Christian ask you, tell you, you shouldn't have done that. That's not Christ-like. If it's never happened to you, I don't want to pray that you sin so you find it out. But it has a tendency to humble you. It's happened to me. This is what the Bible tells us. That God hates sin and doesn't want it anywhere around him. Psalms 5. Certainly you are not a God who approves of evil. Evil people cannot dwell with you. Arrogant people cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who behave wickedly. You destroy liars. The Lord despises violent and deceitful people. Psalms 101. He who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. Revelation 21. But there shall be no means by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. But any of those who are, whose names are written in the book of life. Those scriptures I just read to you. It's very direct and God does not appreciate sin. He doesn't like it. He hates it. He despises it. And he's going to use the Babylonians to punish his people. He's using sinful people to punish his children. Why? The fact still remains that sin must be punished. And the people of Judea were living in sin. These people were doing the things that society deemed A OK. They were doing what their neighbors were doing. They claimed to be Christian. They claimed to be God's children. They took in the ways of worship that were accepted by society. How many churches do you know that do that? We've got to accept some of these things so the sinner isn't ashamed of coming to church. We've got to welcome them in so they feel comfortable in coming. Maybe they didn't want to offend their neighbors and they wanted to be accepted by their neighbors. We need to do some of these things so that the sinner feels comfortable in coming to church. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as would have them do unto you. God is love. We've got to love everybody. How often have you heard that? It's so true. It's not a lie. God is love. God loves everybody. 
So we need to love everybody. But let's not talk about the wrath of God and what it looks like when it comes to, to sin. That makes people uncomfortable. They might stop coming if I start talking about the wrath of God and what it looks like. Do what it takes to get them in the door. Then we'll try and convert them. No wonder it's said the church is full of hypocrites. In Jeremiah 25, God gave Jeremiah a message to give to Judea. In verse 1, it says that this was the first year that Nebuchadnezzar became king of Babylon. Jeremiah tells the people, listen, I've been talking to you about these things. I've been delivering you these messages from God for 23 years now. But you don't pay attention. You're not listening to me. You don't even give me the time of day. I've been telling you sin, disobedience must be punished. All sinners will pay the price. God, God's love does not allow sin to go on. He will do something to you to turn you away from sin and turn, it, turn you to Him. God is a patient God. Why hasn't Jesus returned yet? They don't want to lose one sheep. They want all to come to Him. In verse 9, 25 verse 9, in Jeremiah 25 verse 9, I will send and take all the families of the north, and Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon, my servant, Nebuchadnezzar, God's servant, Babylon, the nasty sinners, God's servant, they are a tool that God is using to punish them. The other day on the news, there was a story. I don't even remember what the lady did. She saved somebody from something. And they were talking about how hero heroic she was. She's a hero. <clears throat> she says, no, I didn't do anything. God's the one that did it. I was just the instrument. Right on the newscast. I said, praise the Lord. We need more of that. I got off track. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, and against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and perpetual disillusions. What happened, Nebuchadnezzar? He lost his mind for seven years because he didn't acknowledge God. Mm -hmm. when he threw them three men in the furnace what happened to them then he said he is the true God he saved you in that fiery furnace he is the true God Daniel in the lion's den <coughs> the acknowledgement that God is the true God What happened after that? They got mad and sang off and they ate grass. Yeah. <laughs> he judged them. The Babylon, where's Babylon now? Well, it's gone. There's no trace of it. It's rubble. They turned from God and disobeyed him. 
They pay the price for sin, for disobedience. If you think you can get away with a little bit of a sin and disobedience, it ain't going to happen. If judgment day comes, Jesus Christ will judge you. We don't know how long that it was as Habakkuk was asking God to intervene. So he didn't have to watch a Judean sacrificing the sons and daughters. We do know that Jeremiah was telling the people for 23 years, you need to repent. You need to come back to God. God's going to punish you for your sin. How long has it been since you took the time to really sit down and wait for God to tell you something? How long has it been that God has been trying to tell you something, but you didn't listen? Or you know that God was there? Roman gave examples of his past year, of how God worked in their lives. You know that God had something to tell you, but you were just too busy to listen. Tell me, Lord, as I go about my daily life, surely you can talk to me while I'm doing this over here. I'll listen as I work the day and night. How often have you had that attitude? I just can't do that today, that God. Just talk to me while I'm going on. How often was it you didn't like the answer that God gave you? Habakkuk had asked a question. And apparently he didn't like the answer. Because the second question is, how could you do it that way? I don't like that. I just don't understand why you're using them to punish us. Yeah, God, I know sin requires punishment. That you will bring judgment on those who live in sin. But God, isn't this a bit much? Those Babylonians are terrible people. In my opinion, the cure is worse than the illness. But is it really? <clears throat> when the consequence of sin is eternal death, Don't you believe that God loves you so much that He'll do something to make you turn around? He'll take the measures, measures necessary to make it happen if you're willing. Huh. If you're willing. You must decide you want to. It's your choice. God can't force you to worship Him. God can't force you to come to church and fellowship with other Christians. You have to make the choice, decision that you want to. You must decide you want to open that door and let Jesus Christ in when He's standing here in the room. Sin is sin no matter who it is. The problem is the children of God were living in sin. They claimed to know God. They claimed to have cho be the chosen people of God. I'm guessing they would brag about it. 
I often heard someone brag about how good a Christian I am. I go to church, I do this, this, and this. I'm on this kind of activity, I do this. I do all these things. Look how good I am. But then they do something that a non-Christian says a Christian wouldn't do that. The children of Judea, they knew better. They had worshipped and praised God, but they turned their back on God. So their sin was more disgraceful. Do you believe that that's the sin of a Christian is worse or better than a sinner that does not proclaim to be a Christian? Or are they the same? Claiming to be a Christian and living in a disobedience of the Word of God is more of an outrageous sin than someone who does not claim to be a Christian and lives in the same sin. I'm not going to ask you whether you believe that or not, but I want you to think about it. It's not going to end well for the one who turns his back on God because he knows better. God's wrath will be aimed right at you. You'll be in the crosshairs. Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. How often have we heard once, once saved, always saved? This puts a yellow light on it. Since they crucified, God, crucified again for themselves the Son of God and put him <coughs> to an open shame. Has anybody ever shamed you? Something happened that you were embarrassed by? I'm sure none of the parents had a child that ever did anything that embarrassed them. Right, Rachel? I mean, Mary? No comment. No comment. I was thinking of holidays out here. The other way around now, we get to embarrass her. You get to embarrass her. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Hebrews 10, verses 26 and 7. For if we deliberately keep on sinning after receiving the knowledge of truth, no further sacrifice or sin is left for us. But only a certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume God's enemies. Jesus only came one time to hang on the cross and he's not going to do it again. The next time he comes, the next thing that happens is judgment day. Second Peter 2.21 says that it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it. 
James 4, 17, to know to do good but do it, but not doing it, this is sin. So, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ and have turned your back on Jesus, you better start thinking about doing something about it. From what I can read from Scripture, I could go on with more Scripture. There's a special kind of wrath that will be delivered for sinning as a Christian. Once you turn your back on Jesus Christ, I guess you could say He puts a target on your back. It'll be hard for you to turn around and come back to God. We often ask why. Why God? Habakkuk in, in chapter 2 verse 1 says, I will stand at my watch post. I will remain stationed on the city wall. I will keep watching. So I can see what he says to me. And can know how I should answer when he counters my argument. How often have you prayed to God for something? You know full well the thing you're asking for or praying for probably isn't quite in line with what God wants you to be praying for. So you prepared an answer for when he answers you. Because you know that really it's not quite the way it should be. I don't think it's a bad thing that Habakkuk did. For asking God why. Give me understanding of what you are doing. But not fully expecting God to really tell him why. God doesn't always answer that question. And we must expect that. But we also must tell God what we're thinking, what's in our hearts, what's in our souls. It's important that we talk to God about it. That's what he was doing. He was talking to God about it, having a conversation. And that's what we need to do. God, I don't understand this. I don't understand what you're doing. But I know that you are right in all things. It's a thing of trusting God. Knowing that even though I don't know the answer, that I can trust that God is going to do what's good for me. What brings Him glory? We're here to serve God. We serve Him to glorify Him. It's okay to tell God, I don't really agree with how things are. But the important thing is to be willing to wait and listen for God to respond. Find that special nook that you have. That special tree you have of quietness and stillness and wait and listen. God will respond. It's important that we be still and know that God will have an answer. 
It may not be what we want, but we can trust that it is the right one for our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful that we have these scriptures. Sometimes these scriptures in the Old Testament are hard to understand and wonder why are they there. But when we dig around in them and study them and meditate, and allow the Holy Spirit to guide us through, there is a message there for us, even though they've been written two, three thousand years ago. They're still for us today. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we as your followers can in, some, in a small way understand the message that you have for us. And that we have the will to follow that message wherever it may lead us. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.